This program proudly brought to you by IPO Wealth for the sophisticated investor. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. I'm Peter Switzer. Coming up tonight, the state of play of consumer finance stocks and how you should position yourself ahead of next month's Senate inquiry findings. Our market mavens, Julia Lee and Michael McCarthy, are here to weigh in on the stocks that you should be thinking going to 2019. But first, a man who founded a high tech company that's changing the face of retail and the way we buy things nowadays. Zip Pay founder and COO Peter Gray joins me at the desk. Peter, Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Peter. So you, you really are in a really hot space at the moment. Uh, but for the sake of my viewers, explain to me the history of the company and the problem you and your co-founder, Larry Diamond, wanted to solve. Sure. Thanks, Peter. Well, um, I initially met Larry in about December 2012, almost randomly, and we identified uh, that we were very much aligned in understanding that the, the, the credit card model was fundamentally broken. Mm. We saw a significant opportunity to sort of disrupt the world of, of credit cards um, and retail finance. So we essentially spent the next six months getting to know each other um, at the Commodore Hotel uh, in North Sydney, which was equidistance between our, our two residents, yeah, right. uh, planning out the future of Zip. We incorporated the company in about 2013, mm. uh, wrote our first customer uh, account in December 2013, many milestones along the way, including listing and yeah. uh, finance ourselves now with uh, over a million active accounts and 12,000 retailers. Okay, now I know we have a chart that actually shows the, the problem of credit cards as you saw it, right. but in a nutshell, what did you and Larry agree was wrong with the credit card model that most of us use when we're, we're buying retail stuff? Yeah, they were, the, the product's just not customer friendly, so in, in, in a number of ways. It, it's not simple, it's not transparent, there's very hard sign-ups mm. uh, for consumers to, to actually apply, uh, un, unfriendly terms that uh, rely on the consumers revolving high balances and, and interest revenue for the, for the providers to exist. Mm. Um, there was a, a, a lack of um, understanding with uh, the minimum repayment, you know, minimum repayment terms took a customer 12 to 20 months, uh, 12 to 20 years. Yeah, the fine but, print has brought a lot of people undone, hasn't right. it? Yep. So, so we, we identified the opportunity to design a simple interest-free product that uh, was easy to understand uh, with balances paid back in months, not years. OK, explain for the viewers who have never used ZipPay or your rival's product, what do you actually do? How does it actually work in the, in the shop? So we're a little different to, to some of our competitors in, in what's described as the buy now, pay later space. We, o we offer consumers an account, mm -hmm. uh, an unsecured line of credit. Uh, mm -hmm. The consumer is able to sign up uh, in store or online mm -hmm. uh, through a very simple process. We consume significant amounts of, of big data to make a responsible and informed decision. So mm -hmm. we're running credit checks, ID checks and banking verification checks on our customers to assure our product is suitable. Mm -hmm. uh, once a customer is approved, they receive uh, a line of credit. They're able to make purchases under that line of credit. Mm -hmm. The balance is aggregated and the consumer can then set their repayments monthly, weekly or fortnightly. And you've got basically two companies where one company, ZipPay, has a $1,000 limit, is that right? So uh, the company, the headco is called Zipco. Mm. We offer two products to market. Mm. One is ZipPay. Mm. Uh, it's for your everyday spend. It has a maximum limit of $1,000 typically uh, for everyday purchases. And a young person really couldn't go over the 1000 Absolutely not. Capped at a thousand, mm -hmm. and we have a fully regulated product called Zip Money, which facilitates purchases up to thirty thousand. Typically, furniture, home improvements, pools, solar panels, etc. Yeah, swim pools. <laughs> all, all, all interest free. Well, yeah, swim now, pay later. That's right. All right. So, so you, um, in terms of you know um, um, your your point of difference, because there has there's a, there's no, have you been covered by a Senate inquiry or not at this point in time? Where are we with Buy now, pay later. Where are we with regulation? Yeah. Uh, so ASICS recently conducted a review into the buy now, pay later sector. Yep. Uh, the findings were released uh, just prior to Christmas. Yep. They identified there was significant take up um, from these types of products by Australian consumers. North of two million customers uh, mm -hmm. are using these products. They indicated that uh, they'd be happy to use them again, four and five. They also identified there was differences in the models uh, of each of the players in the, in the space. We, we, as touched on, we, we're conducting uh, credit checks and ID checks and banking checks mm. prior to onboarding our customers, providing them with an account. Mm. The majority of other players in the sector uh, have limited onboarding and a, and a more transactional-based model where each customer is approved for a transaction and the repayments are structured to repay back their transaction. So, so for, so for example, Afterpay, yep. I, th there's no credit checks in a sense. So I go in, I, I, I like for a $300 product, I've got X amount of time to pay it off and there's penalties if I'm, I'm late. 
Correct. So, so how do you differ from that? So we, we, we are doing full ID credit and banking checks to ensure our customers can afford our, our repayments. Uh, the afterpay model has a, a rigid four payment uh, repayment structure for each transaction. We, we're giving our customers more flexibility to structure their repayments to suit their budget and their lifestyle, either weekly, fortnightly or monthly. Do you think the market understands the differences between you guys at this point in time? I think initially there was there was sort of bundling uh, the buy now pay later all together. Yeah. Certainly, um, the last two years, uh, both the the consumer base and the retail base have come to understand the differences between us and and Afterpay and the other models. Mm. Uh, regulation has probably taken a little bit uh, longer to catch up, as would be not untypical for any innovative or disruptive sort of technology based platform. Okay, so uh, looking at the if, like I. The number of um, customers you've got, both on the consumer side and the business side, because having a, a retailer or, or a business sign up with you guys is really important to your model as well, isn't it? Absolutely. So we, we couldn't survive without our retailers. We, we operate on a, a closed loop environment. So our consumers can only use us mm. to a zip accredited partner. Mm. So we have north of 12,000 partners across a wide variety of, of verticals, um, traditional retail, healthcare, travel, uh, home improvement. So the, the utility of our product sort of spans anywhere that a, a credit card could be used. And mm. our mandate is to be anywhere that a card could be used for payment. And I guess if you've got a retailer who signs up for ZipPay and he's got a, a regular uh, loyal customer base, they walk in and they see ZipPay, that, that's a potential customer for you then? Absolutely. Mm. So the, the beauty of our model is we, we have been able to scale off the back of our retail relationships, yeah. providing uh, businesses such as ours with a cheap customer cost of acquisition, um, we sort of able to leverage off the relationship that any customer does have with a retailer, mm -hmm. you know, differentiating ourselves from players like banks who have to advertise above the line to acquire their customers. Okay. Um, the threat of new rivals coming into the market, maybe from overseas, or banks deciding they want to try and buy you because you're, you're cutting into their, into their um, or eating their lunch? Yes, yeah, so uh, there, there's definitely room at, at checkout for, for solutions if they're fundamentally different. Mm. So I think both retailers and consumers understand the differences between us and, and the afterpayer style model. Mm. Uh, whether or not there's room for any more, uh, they would need to be providing uh, sort of a fundamental difference in terms of benefit to retailer or consumer to probably get a, a spot at that checkout. Yeah. Um, you know, who, kn who knows in the future, Westpac is already on the share register, so they've obviously seen the light. Yeah, okay. And what about, it seems to me, a critical important important thing for you is to make sure you've got funding. It's all very well you, you say, I will provide funding, but you, where do you get your money from? Yeah, that's a great question. So on the journey, the, the funding piece of the equation has been something we've always had to have our eyes on. And, mm. and in the early days, uh, it was very difficult to get that sort of backing. Uh, as a startup, no one knew our, our underwriting models and they were unproven to some degree. Um, we secured a $100 million facility with Victory Park Capital in 2015, a, a US-based firm who believed in fintech and mm. supported fintech. Um, we've, that was a higher cost um, arrangement, which we've subsequently refinanced now. We now have a, a funding capacity uh, up to $750 million through mm. an off-balance off sheet warehouse uh, with the National Australia Bank as the senior note holder. Okay, so that, we've primarily, primarily talked about zip pay. Zip money, in a nutshell, how does that differ? Uh, it's, it's similar in terms of product construct in that the customer gets a line of credit where they're able to make purchases. Um, yep. It's interest free on every transaction again, um, up to $30,000 terms of 6, 12, 24 or 36 months for the larger ticket purchases. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's, it's a fully regulated credit product so there's, there's a number of validations. And you've also got Pocketbook, explain that quickly. So Pocketbook is Australia's uh, leading personal finance management app and mm. again a point of differentiation for our business is not only do we have the unregulated uh, buy now pay later product, we obviously have the, the regulated zip money product mm. but also Pocketbook. Mm. So Pocketbook currently has over 500,000 active users mm. so it's a free app, a user signs up and is able to aggregate all their bank accounts to receive one view. Mm. We're able to provide tools that uh, assist them with budgeting and, and monitoring of their spending. And you have, a, you have a pretty positive view on millennials and their interest in money. Absolutely. So the millennials that we see uh, are certainly different to uh, some of the perceptions. Uh, yeah. They, we believe, they get a bit of a bum rap, and they're much more financially savvy than uh, others would have them believe. The users mm. of, of, of pocketbooks certainly uh, demonstrate that. I mean, ev even on the, the ZipPay product, for example, mm. uh, we do over-index to millennials. But it's interesting that the average credit score of a ZipPay customer is actually higher than your credit card applicant. Okay, one last quick score. one. Do you worry the government might try to interfere with your business model as it currently? Sit, sits. 
Uh, we, we support a push for, for further regulation to mm. the sector. We believe uh, the, the sector has advanced very rapidly. There's differing standards amongst the players in the industry. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we seek and support ASIC in their mandate to, mm. to be granted further powers. Is that primarily because you're really happy about the quality of your, of your um, standard? Oh, I think we're very well placed and we understood yeah. uh, from inception about you know, ASIC's focus on responsible lending and the community's expectations about uh, products and could deliver consumer harms. Yep. So uh, most certainly we're very well placed for further regulation. Okay, Pete, thanks for joining us on the program. Good luck with uh, the company. And I guess you're, you and me would hope the share price goes up. Now, I'm not a shareholder at this point in time, but still an interesting company. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having Cheers, me. Cheers, mate. Peter Gray, co-founder of uh, ZipPay, or ZipCo, the correct, correct name is. Coming up, Julia Lee of Bell Direct with her pick of the week. And uh, I'm going to ask her what she thinks of Zip. Welcome back to Money Talks. We're looking at consumer finance stocks tonight and to cast a critical eye of the potential winners and losers in the sector. We're joined by my wonderful hot stock girl, <laughs> Julia <laughs> Lee. Thanks for coming to the program, Julia. Great to be here, Pete. All right, now, you want to talk about consumer finance stocks and we just had the co-founder of Zip. What do you think of Zip? Look, I think it's really interesting, this consumer finance space. Yeah. There's a Senate inquiry at the moment, so a lot of the related stocks have seen a bit of a backward move in terms of share price, mm. and the final report should come down in February, so there is a risk involved. There. Same time as Haynes comes down, February's going to be a big month, isn't it? And it's half year earning season, so yeah, it's, good point. Yeah. it's, you know, sort of second Christmas for mm. a stock analysts like me, yeah. very busy. Yeah. Um, but I guess looking at the space, um, I kind of divide it into two different areas, and one is the consumer finance uh, that's sort of affected by the economic cycle, the soft housing at the moment, mm. which would in impact on companies like uh, Flexi Group, for example. Mm. And then on the other side, you've almost got the fintech and the new revolution of these consumer finance companies mm. like Afterpay as well as Zip Money, which, although the cycle might be getting a little bit softer from a retail and domestic economy mm. point of view, they're growing in terms they of are. the number of they're, merchants they're, they're structurally signing different, on. aren't they? Because even if retail's not growing at the same rate, there's more and more people shifting to this unusual form of purchasing. Well, it's funny, I was talking to a friend the other day about Zip Money and Afterpay pay and she was saying well you know I've actually just torn up my credit cards and I use these because the interest free period is a lot longer and yeah, I don't need their credit like cards a anymore. Two, um, a year or even two years sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose that's the other risk that we will see the more traditional financial services providers start to um, get a, a, yeah. a bit upset up about some of the numbers that might be coming out. But um, Well they might try and purchase some of these companies too. And there has been um, a, a bit of speculation for a while that not only the domestic uh, financial companies, but perhaps even some of the international yeah, ones yeah, yeah. as well, because um, a lot of comparisons have been made to uh, uh, PayPal, which yeah. also revolutionised the industry and the way we pay for yeah. purchases online as well. So look, yeah. I think it's an extremely interesting area that's yeah. been beaten down over the last couple of months. There is a risk there from the Senate inquiry. Mm -hmm. I think there's less of a risk for some of these more fintech type of companies like Afterpay and Zip Money, mm -hmm. but certainly uh, the risk is there for CCD. What companies do you think are vulnerable? to the Senate inquiry? Well, definitely the payday lenders because it's mm. into Australians who are um, distressed financially. What, what names are we talking about there for, for my um, viewers? Well, cash converters would yep. be top of mind. Exactly. They just have a new CEO as mm. well coming on board in 2019, so they'll probably have a new strategy in place. Yep. So large risks in terms of cash converters, as you can see from the share price, yep. the stocks um, down substantially. And in fact, over the last three months... What about companies like Credit Corp and Flexi Group? Because they're in that sort of space as well, aren't they? Yeah, and I guess they're facing a double whammy because we are seeing a slowdown in terms of housing. So things like Flexi Group, which offer, um, I guess... A loan type of arrangement or a rental type of agreement through stores like Harvey Norman, well, I think we'll see a softness in terms of the product take up, yeah. so yeah. the consumer side of things, as well as the potential impact of the uh, Senate inquiry. So, yeah. look, I'd be a little bit more cautious on things like uh, cash converters, as well as uh, Flexi Group, and even probably Money Three, uh, yeah. which is a smaller company in that uh, consumer finance area. Yeah. But on the flip side, I think um, stocks like companies like Afterpay have been in a dialogue with the regulators for a while now. Yeah, okay. So, so if you are forced to pick between Afterpay and Zip, which one do you go for? 
Well, I pick after pay. And the reason for that is the US retail market is substantially bigger than it's the Australian market. It's expanding at a quicker rate. These guys zip rate. want to stay local. I, I love our growth. The flip side is on the risk side, zip money does a lot more in terms of credit checks, uh, yeah. which means that their bad debts is much lower. And yeah. so as a company that's looking at the financial services space, the risk is lower. However, um, you know, I love the growth that's coming out of after pay yeah. at the moment, given that they've only been in the US for around about... It seems to me both companies have potential, but after pay probably has a, a lot more vol volatility up and down. It's a little bit more different in terms of product. There's extra risk there because they don't do the credit checks and mm. I think the process is a bit easier. Yeah. But on the flip side, with Zip Money, you have those larger purchases which are quite attractive as yeah, well yeah. and the lower risk profile. Two very interesting companies. All right, that's um, Julia Lee and the hot stocks for the week. Uh, Michael McCarthy's coming out next from CNC Markets. We'll ask him about Zip as well, but also how he wants to invest in 2019. And I'll get Julia to interrupt along the way as well because she <laughs> likes to to do that. Back in a moment. Welcome back. We're joined by, by Julia Lee again and also Michael McCarthy from CMC Markets. And before I ask Michael about how he wants to invest in 2019, Zip Money, what do you think? I like it. Peter, um, and I, I note the comparison with Afterpay, and that, that is a large part of their business, but they have other um, aspects of their business which differentiates mm. them. They've got the uh, Pocket Money app, yeah. um, and they've got a few bits and pieces. It's clear disruption is continuing in this yeah. space. I think both companies are set to do well, and I, I like them both. I, guess. I like both mm. of their models, Peter, and you know what I like most about them? No one's complaining. Mm. Regulators tend to come down hard where consumers are upset. And yeah. I know in the payday space, yeah. we've certainly seen some complaints. I'm not hearing much about either Zip or Afterpay. I like it. OK. Um, let's talk about 2009. And you and I bravely said last year, at the beginning of the year, we can get the 7,000 next year. And, of course, we have to eat humble pie, Julia. But then we didn't know that Trump was going to have tra trade wars. And we didn't know that the government was going to have a Royal Commission in the banks, and that they're really, really important. What, what, what were you calling last year? Oh, I said you did pretty well. We got had the 10-year high, you know. We got yeah. 6,333, didn't we? Yeah, 75. Yeah, yeah. 6375. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's counted every number. <laughs> right, so, so let's, let's talk about this year. Yep. What do you think is going to happen? More of the same, Peter, in that we're going, looking at broadly sideways action. The reality is the market argument now is about what's happening in the distant future, mm. in 2020. What really caused the sell-off was concerns about the US economy and it going backward in two years' time. And the problem with that sort of argument for us as, as investors is that it means sentiment drives the market. Now, it's complicated further because when we get good growth numbers, People might buy growth exposed shares or they might sell interest rate exposed shares because they're worried that rates will go higher. Mm. So now market reactions to unambiguously good data mm. continues to be mixed. And once again, that means sentiment is the key driver. So markets are very likely to swing harder Volatility is very likely to increase, and once again, the rewards are likely to go to active investors, those who take advantage when markets go down to buy more and when markets go up to, to sell. So buying the dip is not out of fashion for 2019? And, oh, I'd argue that this is one of the best opportunities we've seen in a number of years. Mm. The current pullback, it's deeper than what we've seen, mm. and it's hanging around at levels it appears to stabilise. It's now hanging around, people, giving people a chance to get yeah. on board. Yeah, Joy? Oh, I think you have to be a, a bit more quick on timing so I agree with Michael that you have to be um, a bit more quicker in terms of the timing side of the equation but I guess this late cycle for me the big question mark is around earnings because if you see earnings growth accelerating that it will be supportive for the market yep. the fear is that you know half year reporting season here in February we've seen a few warning signs already coming not only from the residential housing space but the domestically focused space so mm. some warnings coming from discretionary retailers as well so for me February reporting season here in Australia is going to be make or break for the Australian market mm. and of course this week it's a massive week for the US once again we see quarterly earnings last year we saw um, the the tax changes over the US in the US boosting but of course if we see a moderation in terms of earnings growth coming through from the US it's going to make it pretty hard for the US stock market to reach mm. record highs like it did last so what do you reckon about US corporate earnings are you do you think at one stage the sell-off got so bad it's kind of saying that there will be zero growth in, in Europe. And that was just crazy. That was the, probably the best time to start buying, wasn't it? The, the kind of 8 or 9% is kind of the number the market's... But it's downgrading a little bit at the moment. 
Uh, well, I've actually seen it edge up slightly, according oh, to Bloomberg consensus. Okay. Uh, so it does look like there's been some upward revision recently. You're right. Mm -hmm. The trend was down from nine to eight, currently around eight and a quarter. Okay. A consensus estimate. So eight percent earnings growth is still pretty oh, solid. Very growth. big growth one periods. Before. Well, that's right. We had two quarters last year where growth across the whole S&P 500 was 20% plus. Yeah. So that's profits growing by 20% across uh, two, 500 companies. That's extraordinary, isn't it, really? Well, six out of the last seven quarters we've seen double-digit growth coming mm. through from S&P 500 companies. Yeah. The problem is if you see earnings growth dropping from 20% down to 8%, will the market adjust upwards for that growth mm. or downwards for that growth? And I'd argue that we've seen the market volatility because mm. the market's adjusting to the lower levels of growth. But it seems to me, just listening, listening to what we've we all said already, that because it went down so far, it seems to me if we do get an 8 or 9% eight or growth, the US market could grow at a much slower rate, but there's a reason for the market to go up because it went down so far and now it's getting an 8% number. We should ex think that it's possible that US stocks will go up. I mean, the other part of it is I love You're periods. Up, <laughs> I love periods like this. Yeah. These periods are quite rare. They are the make or break periods of you know your wealth portfolio over the next five to seven years. You yeah. don't get these opportunities often, so you know grab it by both hands, and you you don't have to do it all at once. Okay. You can you're going to, he's going to grab by both hands. What are you going to grab? What, what, what kind of stocks are you going to be buying? in Australia, given your view on the US Well, market. first of all, I'm long index calls, yep. so that if I don't find all the companies I want, I'll still get exposure to an upward move. Right. But having said that, I'm looking for the most unpopular sectors, Peter. Mm. That's often where we see the best performance of the year. Those stocks that are really on the nose and have a turnaround. So Costa Group the year. mentioned today, you like Costa Group, and it was backed up last week. I like Costa Group and I like the reject shop. Mm. Right, these are two retail exposures. I, I'm quite confident around at current share price levels, mm. they represent reasonable value. And uh, I own them both, Peter, mm. hand in the air, I own them both. Mm. So, um, at, but retail is an area I've been looking at very closely for the last six weeks. Yep. I'm looking for selective opportunities. Some, I wouldn't touch my with your money, Peter, right? There are some retail Thanks. opportunities that I think are still <laughs> declining, but uh, there are some good opportunities. And the in banks, the space. ahead of the recommendations from Hay, are they a buy now or is, yes? I'm long, right. all, I'm long all for in Macquarie. Yeah. Okay. Julia? I love Costa Group as well. Um, I bought it last week. Um, and th when these big profit warnings come out, the, the question I ask myself is, is this a once-off or is this going to keep on happening? And for me, the, the story around Costa, Costa Group, the expansion, the scale, the selling into Asia, Asia makes up only around, well, China makes up only about 5 to 6 percent of sales at the moment. Yeah. I really do think that's going to increase to double digits. I think that story is still intact. So it's a, a bargain to be getting into a longer-term story mm. of the type of prices that we Well, have. today in the Switzer Report, I wrote a piece about the top 20 stocks because a lot of people have been telling me top 20 stocks are going to do well. They did well last quarter. Didn't they? And I was staggered. If you get to the top 20, 10 of them have double digit gains, if you believe the analysts. And, and like, you know, the banks are around, what, 15, 16 percent? And this was before we added in dividends and franking credit. So uh, I figure that even if people aren't exposed to the market, if, it, if you buy the top 20 stocks, you still are holding probably the top 20 companies in Australia. And, and you're going to put your income as well. I know it's not good for a, a, a high growth person oh, no. like you. I absolutely agree. When you see volatility in markets as we are at the moment, yeah. those stable cash flows um, come at a premium. So you're willing to pay a premium for those stable cash flows. And often the top 20, because they are more mature companies, they do trade at lower PE ratios because they do have lower rates of growth. Mm. But in times of volatility, those stable cash flows are actually a shelter from the storm. So Shouldn't I come think. Again. Um... Shouldn't come again. <laughs> All right, guys, we are out of time. Thanks Thanks very much for joining us. Right, As always, a great debate. That's the Money Talk program for tonight. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining us. Check out switzer.com.au if you want to know what I'm thinking every day about the markets. Good night. This program proudly brought to you by IPO Wealth for the sophisticated investor.